morning, congregation, and welcome to worship this morning. We continue in our series, I Am In. And the third sermon in the series this morning is I Am Influential. As a call to worship this morning, I read from the Psalms, Psalm 18, reading from verses 1 to 3. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock in whom I take refuge. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. Let us pray together. Lord, we are so grateful for the relationship that we have with you. You are the source of all life, giver of all grace. In all things, we want to thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains our lives, for the food of this earth that nurtures life, and for the love of family and friends without which there would be little happiness in life. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of creation and for this great earth. Thank you for the many ways in which we are cared for. Thank you for the many ways we can serve and give to others. Our hearts are grateful for all that you have given us in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for the mistakes of the past week and release us from guilt. Set us free to love and serve you and forgive us as you have forgiven us. Open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are two readings this morning and the first one is taken from Matthew chapter 5 and reading from verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and reading from verses 1 to 34. Now Jesus learnt that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sachar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the, the water I give then will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worshipped what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. 
The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. The disciples rejoined Jesus. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving the water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, have something to eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then the disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. In our lives, we have no idea how one conversation, one word of encouragement, or one expression of love may change someone's life. You have no idea how God might use one word, one moment, one generous expression in the life of another person. The definition of an influencer in the marketing world, according to the dictionary, is a person with the ability to influence potential buyers of a product or service by promoting or recommending the items on social media. This is not how we would have defined what an influencer is. In our lives, we would have known an influencer to be a good parent, maybe a sports coach, or a good teacher, or maybe your Sunday school teacher or a, a good friend. We would have called them influencers. Today's culture says that an influencer is a celeb, a content creator, someone who has a, has a lot of followers on social media. Jesus uses two metaphors to show you what you are. In Matthew's gospel, he says you are salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, he says. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled upon. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So what does salt do? Salt purifies. Salt preserves. Salt adds flavor. Without food, food without salt, sorry, is insipid and has a terrible taste. Salt adds flavor to any meal. Christianity is to life what salt is to food. Christianity lends flavor to life. What does light do? Light illuminates. Light guides. A light can be a warning light. For example, a lighthouse or a warning light on the dashboard of your car. What did Jesus mean then when he said you have to be light? He meant you are to be seen. You're not to be a secret disciple. Your Christianity should be visible for all to see. You should be as much a Christian at work, at home, at school, on the golf course, or in church. Jesus did not say that you are the light of the church. He said you are the light of the world. Your presence in the world should be the light that illuminates Christ's love for the world to see. A light serves as a guide. A light makes the way clear for all to see. Just think about driving on the roads at night. With no street lights, you would have great difficulty in finding your way. A light can serve as a warning light. A light will tell you when to stop because there's danger ahead. A light flashing, for example, on the dashboard of your car, maybe could be the sign that your seatbelt is not on. As a Christian... It may just be that because you warned someone of a potential danger in their decision, that they could avoid a tragic life mistake. Maybe someone has said to you before, I would never have been in the situation in which I now find myself if only someone had spoken to me and warned me. The point that Jesus makes with these two metaphors is this. He's trying to tell us very clearly that we are not useless that we have a purpose, that each one of us is an influencer. 
You are meant to be the salt of the earth. And so you are meant to purify. You are meant to preserve. You are meant to add flavor. Wherever you are, you are to be the salt of the earth. You are an influencer. Others must see your good deeds. What you do must be attractive. And your good deeds must draw attention to God. You are the light of the world. The problem with influencers is that it starts with a platform. Social media platforms, for example, Instagram or Facebook and so on. How many likes you have received determines how influential your post has been. The size of your platform then determines the scope of your influence. But true and lasting influence always starts with people before a platform. It always starts with people. The good news is you all have people who come into your sphere of influence every single day of your lives. You are called to be an influencer. Influence is not always obvious. Influence is not always instant. Influence is not measured in the amount of likes on Facebook or Instagram. Just because you don't see a harvest does not mean that your seed did not take root. You have no idea how God might use you in one moment to plant a seed that will grow into a real and lasting influence in the life of somebody else. There is a story of the most unlikely influencer in the New Testament, and we read that in the Gospel of John this morning. A Samaritan woman at a well whom Jesus talks to. Remember in the story we, we read that Jesus was passing through Samaria on his way back to Galilee. This no doubt was a, a strange thing to do because Jews did not interact with Samaritans. And they would have done anything to avoid going anywhere near them. And even worse, if you were a Jew, you would never have interacted with a Samaritan woman. Then Jesus sits next to a well and asks a Samaritan woman for a drink. He said to her, will you give me a drink? She was not only a woman, but a Samaritan, a member of the hated mixed race, a woman living in sin who now finds herself in a public place. No respectable Jewish man would talk to a woman under those circumstances, but Jesus did. Race, social position, or past sins do not matter to Jesus. The gospel is for every person, and Jesus crossed all barriers to share the good news of the gospel. Jesus dignifies this woman by starting a conversation with her, and she's thrown completely off guard. Listen to how she responds to his request for a drink. Verses 8 to 9. The Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus, in verse 10 of John chapter 4, replies with love. He says, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What did Jesus mean by this word living water? In the Old Testament, many verses speak of thirsting after God as one thirsts for water. Psalm 42 and verse 1 refers to that. God is called the, the fountain of life in Psalm 36 and verse 9, and the spring of living water in Jeremiah 17 and verse 13. So in saying he would bring living water that could forever quench a, pers a person's thirst for God, Jesus in that very moment was claiming to be the Messiah, her Messiah. Only the Messiah could give this gift that satisfies the deep desires of the soul. Jesus answered her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty. Again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give the, him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This woman notices that this man is very different. And she says to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus honors her. 
He approaches her with love in his heart, all the time knowing that she's an outcast in her community, divorced five times, living with someone. Jesus does not look at her as a poor woman, but as a, a miracle waiting to happen, as a person who can have enormous influence in the lives of others. And he dawns on her that she has heard there would be a Messiah coming. And she has heard about this man doing miracles. Why would a, a Jewish man speak to me, she would have thought, and show me such honor and respect and love? Perhaps in that moment she thought, this is the one I've been waiting for. The woman did not immediately understand what Jesus was talking about when he referred to living water. It takes time to accept something that changes the very foundations of your life. Jesus allowed the woman time to ask questions and put the pieces together for herself. And so she thinks to herself, well, just perhaps this could be the Messiah. In verse 19 of John chapter 4, she says to Jesus, Sir, I can see you are a prophet. And she leaves her water and she runs back to the village. John tells us, leaving her jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? What happened next is quite unbelievable. John tells us that they came out of the town and made their way towards him. The people came streaming to see Jesus. What do we see in this powerful story? Firstly, no matter how, how far gone your life is messed up, you're never too far gone for the love of Jesus to reach into your life. And secondly, we see the woman everyone talks about, the town outcast, the immoral woman, the broken woman, going back to town and enthusiastically telling people that this may be the one. She, in that moment, immediately becomes an influencer. Her story shows us that, she, that you don't have to have it all together to influence someone for Christ. You don't have to know it all. You don't have to have a theological degree. You don't, have to have, you don't have to pray powerful prayers. You don't have to have it all together. You don't have to have everything fixed in your life to be an influencer for Jesus. You just have to know who he is. You just have to have had a, a drink from his living water. When you care about the people around you, you can immediate, immediately be light and salt to those people. You just have to care. And expose them to the love of Christ. You don't need 4,000 followers to have a platform. Or 20 likes on Facebook or Instagram. You need to care about one person to have an influence. You are an influencer. You don't have to know it all. You just have to let your light shine. You just have to do what salt does. And so again, I say, you, don't, you have no idea. How one word of encouragement, one expression of love, one word of hope may influence someone towards Jesus. This woman goes back to the village and she tells everyone about Jesus. The disciples, on the other hand, don't pay her too much attention. And John tells us that they told Jesus to just go and have something to eat. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. And then Jesus talks about food by making use of a farming metaphor. And says, the field is ripe for harvest, but the laborers are few. Open your eyes, says Jesus, and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Let's say it this way. The fields are ripe for harvest, but the influences are few. Don't let culture categorize influence as someone on social media. It's, it does not start with a platform. It always starts with the person right in front of you. You are an influencer. The next part of the story says, Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, she said. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. Many people, many Samaritans believed in Jesus because of the influence of one Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman shared her experience of Christ with others. Despite her reputation, many accepted her invitation to come and meet Jesus. Even if there are sins in your past that you're ashamed of, 
Christ does change you. As people see these changes, they become curious. So use these opportunities to introduce them to Christ. You're an influencer. Who did God use? Not an Instagram star, not a professional athlete, not a celeb, not a content creator, but a regular, a regular ordinary, broken, everyday, sinful woman who had been transformed by Jesus. You have influence exactly where you are. You don't have to have your whole life together to have any influence. So when you greet people who come to church, you're an influencer in that moment. Remember, they feel nervous maybe about coming for the first time. You can have an enormous impact on their lives. When you listen to someone who is hurting at work and you represent the love of Jesus to them in that moment, you are an influencer. By the way you carry yourself, live your life, by who you are and whose you are, you are an influencer. Let us pray. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Lord, we pray today for more people to help with your work. We ask for boldness in the face of opposition. We pray for opportunities to share the good news with others. And we pray for success. In a dark and discouraged world, may the light of Christ shine through us. Let us speak words that glorify you and point people to Jesus. Open our eyes to see people around us the way you do. Let the joy of your presence shine through us. May we be beacons of hope that draw people to you, their living water. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.